Final Fantasy XV is one of the most emotionally engaging games I've ever played. It's also a complete mess. Best described as a road trip simulator come role playing game, Final Fantasy XV's epic tale of the Crown Prince Noctis is the result of over 10 years worth of hair gel, sweat and tears, tracing its roots back to the long since aborted Final Fantasy vs XIII, and this troubled lineage is reflected in every mile travelled. Both technically and structurally, this latest entry in the series is afflicted with a myriad of problems, from small glitches and crashes to some more egregious narrative failings, and yet somehow none of this makes one iota of a difference when it comes to the emotional journey at the game's core. I think this is because, above all else, Final Fantasy XV is a story about friendship. If you try to look further, for example at the expanded lord of its world, you begin to see the cracks of games long abandoned, where whole characters and narrative arcs have been left over and forgotten. The remnants of Versus 13 and everything that came after have been cannibalised by the game's final form, the interpersonal drama between Noctis and his friends, Ignis, Gladiolus and Prompto. In spite of the game's troubled production, this aspect very rarely falters. Think what you will, but I think you're good enough for me. So, you really think I'm doing okay? Yeah, I do. Anything else? Akin to Stand By Me or The Goonies, Final Fantasy XV is a story with an unfaltering idealism, an infallible perception of friendship and brotherly love, and it's this idealism that provides the clearest line through the game. I've already pushed myself to the brink of death. You get up. Every element has been jerry-rigged to fit around Noct's core relationships. Combat is based around cooperation, issuing commands on the fly and helping your friends up when the going gets tough, while exploration through the game's open world is consistently punctuated by the musings and opinions of your digital comrades. Wow, it's beautiful. Don't you want to get a picture? Even I couldn't do this justice. Dialogue wheels repeatedly offer the option to defer to your friends, while the game's iconic mode of transportation the royal car, the Regalia, is by default driven by Ignis, not the player, shifting focus away from the road and onto the interactions between the four friends along the way. At first glance, Final Fantasy XV is a Frankensteinian patchwork of conflicting ideas, and yet the underlying emotional narrative of brotherhood and friendship is woven so intelligently into the seams that it becomes elevated far beyond the sum of its parts. I think this is because the game excels in three key aspects. I got your back! Here you go. Back in the early 2000s, following the successes of Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto 3, open world video games rose to stratospheric levels of popularity. In the wake of an era that was largely focused on challenging players, video games instead began to emphasise player agency, the ability to go where you want and do what you want. It was at the turn of the millennium that choice, not challenge, began to be heralded as video gaming's defining characteristic. These days, the majority of popular video games are designed as spaces in which the player can experiment and roam freely. In a game like Skyrim, for example, the player is a nigh-on godlike force that's free to bend the world into whatever shape they see fit. They can slay dragons, topple nations, become rich, powerful, or just trade it all in to go pick flowers. The player is a king and the whole world is their kingdom, ripe to be commanded. With this in mind, I think it's funny that in Final Fantasy XV, in which the player is quite literally royalty travelling through their kingdom, the game shies away from the type of player agency that's been the prevailing trend of the last 15 years. Prince Noctis' journey feels like an odd half-step when contrasted with the open worlds of other modern video games. The player is free to run around at their leisure, sure, but the world itself is blockaded with invisible walls and restrictive pathways. There are many aspects of the game's design that seem consciously designed to reduce player agency. Manually driving the regalia, for example, reveals how limited the game's stalwart means of transportation is. The car is locked into following urban roads, and attempting to drive down a rocky path, or to purposefully steer the car off-road, is met by a strong resistance from the game's controls, which forcefully guide you back onto your expected route. Meanwhile, the silent, reflective exploration offered to the players of sandbox games like The Witcher 3 or Grand Theft Auto V is askewed in favour of the repeated chatter between Noct and his accompanying mouthpieces, ensuring that the moment you come within viewing distance of any notable landmark, you receive in the crew's opinions on it before you can form your own. Although it flies in the face of established convention, 
these restrictions actually work in favour of Final Fantasy XV's emotional journey. It's often telegraphed to the player clumsily, but its world isn't designed as a space for the player to load over like royalty, but instead as a more intimate space for the personal stories between Noct and his friends. The preordained routes for the regalia tend to give weight to the conversations and interactions that take place between the friends on the road, and reveal landmarks in such a way that the companion's chatter flows naturally as they approach on the horizon. Similarly, the game world's harsh borders, although executed lazily, keep the experience focused and frequently defer back to the beaten path, the road trip that forms the game's emotional centre. At most junctures, Final Fantasy XV actively dissuades its player from any inklings that the world should bend to their whims. The climb any mountain approach of most open worlds, as seen in any given E3 demo. In all the little details, like this plant here, the medium details of these logs and trees, and all the way up to distant mountains. And if you've played our previous stuff, you know that mountain is not just a backdrop. You can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. Is traded out for more prescriptive paths, ones that are tailored to the developer's pre prepared stories. Hold up, down there. What is that? For contrast, whether Skyrim has more mountains to climb than you could shake an ice pick at, Final Fantasy XV has just one, and climbing it is achieved by proceeding through a linear corridor. Surprisingly, this isn't a bad thing. There's a point in Rockstar's Red Dead Redemption where, upon first entering the game's open world depiction of Mexico, a rare instance of non-diegetic music will play, an acoustic piece by Jose Gonzalez. It's a surprisingly tender moment in a game otherwise defined by shooting and explosions, and is often held up as one of the game's best moments, if just for the way in which it brings a directorial touch to the game's sprawling world. Although very few of Final Fantasy XV's moments are pulled off quite as effectively, I think that this is the sort of experience that it ultimately aims to create on an hour to hour basis. Final Fantasy XV is open enough that many of its interactions feel organic, but also deceptively linear, so that the big events, like climbing a mountain, are always directed and presented in the context of a group of friends making a journey, as opposed to a lone player jumping up the side of a cliff face for 10 minutes just because they can. Like Red Dead Redemption's introduction to Mexico, it's a more directorial approach to an open world, one focused on emotion over the agency. <sighs> the hell's with the heat? As we climb, so does the temperature. Uh-huh. I'm no geologist, but I'm pretty sure this is a volcano. Hey, what are the chances of it erupting while we're here? Right side, you won't suffer long if it does. To justify this loss of agency, it almost always refers back to Noctis' friends. As the player approaches Final Fantasy XV's Lone Mountain, for example, the supporting cast will express their desire to climb it, and will intuitively attempt to sway the player towards its prescribed entrance. The assumption, as a result, is that the player's path is linear because that's the way his friends want to go. The upside of this limitation is that the linear path itself tends to be a more crafted experience, and as such contains more flavour pieces and scripted interactions between the characters than the game's more traditional open world content. This sure looks like it leads somewhere. It's practically inviting us inside. You think there's something in there? I'd say it's all but guaranteed. In itself, this has a clear effect on the player's perception of the game. Although, at the end of the day, the player is the one who makes the decisions, it's suggested that they're not the only one with a sense of agency. Prompto, Ignis and Gladio will happily and repeatedly make their decisions and wants known, and these wants are reflected in the world's design itself. It's these small interactions that go a large way towards staging the game as a shared experience between a group of friends, and that brings purpose to its unique open world design. As the game's main storyline progresses, this design philosophy is extended to its natural break-in point, by the time the player reaches the last third of the game, the open world ceases to be open altogether. Final Fantasy XV's storyline eventually ditches its open world, instead opting for a largely linear adventure focusing on the plot points that were left lingering back home. The only constants are Gladio, Ignis and Prompto. It's a clear statement that the open world isn't important so much as the people you travel it with. Admittedly, on paper it's easy to see how all of these choices could fall flat. Removing agency from the player runs counter to the popular consensus on game design. 
In the end, I'm not even sure if this approach was intended, or if it's just a happy accident from the game's troubled history boiling over. But I think that Final Fantasy XV's world is interesting because of the way that its limitations force the player to acknowledge and defer to its characters. The playable area retains enough of a sense of openness, enough empty space to be trodden and secrets to be found, that the experience retains some sense of emergence and culpability. And yet by nudging the player away from the more outlandish agency of other open world games, Final Fantasy XV repeatedly prompts its player to focus on the interactions offered by Prompto, Gladio and Ignis. And this is a vital step towards endearing the player to each character. Say, Ignis, how come you like cooking so much? I find the true joy of cooking on the faces of those for whom I cook. Huh. Even as time goes on and the game world opens up, most notably with the introduction of chocobos, which allow the player to travel quickly off a road, the player's relationship with the game's main characters remains a shared experience. This is a world built for purpose. There's very little you can do without being reminded that your comrades are by your side, that there's more than one person on this journey. Oh, it's heavy. Great job, Noct. Nice work, dude! Of course, forcing the player to share their time with the leather and denim crowd does not an emotional connection make. The game's open world may be effective at pushing its player and their companions closer, but the glue that really holds everything together is the game's photography system. Look, it's the Kenny Crow! How about we get a pic of him taking you under his wing? It'll make you happy. It'd give me a mouthful of happiness. Now, in position. On top of all of its world's eccentricities, Final Fantasy XV is staged in distinct cycles. As Noctis and his friends become increasingly bruised by fights, their maximum health points, the resource that allows them to continue fighting, sink lower and lower. To worsen this, there are some genuinely fearsome abominations lurking in the depths of the game's world, and if Noctis approaches them while low on health points, they'll have him eating dirt like it was one of Ignis's recipes. That's it! I've come up with a new recipe! To counteract this, the player either needs to rely on the expensive, cumulative costs of healing items, or, more reasonably, they can sleep at an inn or roadside encampment. Further encouraging the latter option, players earn experience points as they explore, which they can use to upgrade their character, however these can only be cashed in by sleeping. In practice, this means that the player will send Noctis and his company to bed at regular intervals of 30 minutes to an hour. At each of these intervals, the player is presented with a diorama showing staged interactions between the four characters, once again returning to their relationship, and also a series of photographs taken by the group's comic relief Prompto, documenting the journey since the last time they rested. These photographs play a large part in Final Fantasy XV's emotional design. Perfect timing. <laughs> a significant portion of Prompto's photos accurately depict the group's actions, allowing the player to glimpse back at tough fights or scenic moments and reminisce. Amidst Final Fantasy XV's fast-paced combat, it's easy to lose track of the specifics of who's where and doing what, and Prompto's pictures often reveal unexpected and unnoticed moments that bring life to even the most uninteresting of adventures. You may have missed that moment when Ignis was flattened by a giant robot, or when Gladio wore his sword like a sex toy, but Prompto didn't. Prompto's photos show fabricated events too, snapshots of moments that are implied to have happened while the player's back was turned. Often these take the form of group photos or candid selfies, cute character and flavour pieces that voicelessly add texture to the character's relationships. The player can save a large number of these photos if any catch their eye, and the album that this produces effectively becomes a photo journal, a chronological document of the character's journey through Final Fantasy XV's world. This is an effective emotional tool in itself. By constantly generating these photos at the end of every gameplay cycle, it asks the player to reflect on the time spent doing otherwise menial roleplaying housework in more human terms. It ensures that the journey never becomes too mechanical and is always referred back to its characters. It's also a nice compliment to the game's more heavily scripted sequences. You're lucky to survive that. Yeah, what with Prompto busy with the camera. Even the most linear of parts take on personal meaning, just because the photos that emerge from them are wholly unique to each player. It's often made painfully obvious that Final Fantasy XV's player is a puppet in the developer's world, but the dynamic aspects of Prompto's photography help conceal the strings somewhat. 
even when the pre-scripted dialogue runs out and starts repeating, Prompto's photos always have a new story to tell. On a wider scale, the photography element also helps to build emotional connections with the world at large. Although a lot of the game's areas don't boast clear, memorable landmarks, it's likely that as the player spends longer in the world, they'll grow to associate otherwise inconsequential areas with the unique photos they generate. The open world becomes marked by the player's photo album, and by extension the people captured within. Whole areas rise into significance merely because of the photos they play host to. In tandem with the open world's design, Prompto's photographs consistently encourage the player to view the world through its four central characters. Through these pictures, the player's actions are directly acknowledged, and it's in this acknowledgement that the game's scripted avenues begin to take on a life of their own, and seamlessly integrate into the game's more emergent stories. Ultimately, while the open world design brute forces the player to acknowledge the presence of their digital comrades, Prompto's photographs build on this with some much needed subtlety. Every time the player rests, their experience becomes just a little bit more personalised, feeling less like the product of a distant developer, and more like the product of an emerging friendship. Every time Prompto's photographs manage to invoke a laugh, a smile, or you never know, a tear, the game's characters inherit a little more humanity. Of course, the hallmark of any good emotional narrative isn't just having characters that seem human, it's in knowing how to tear them down. The third pillar of Final Fantasy XV's emotional design is the one that's the hardest to quantify. For lack of a better term, this is a game that's built on a foundation of anime nonsense, a medley of impossible hairstyles and weighty breaths that gives its story a distinctly melodramatic kick. So glorious, my crystal. Owing to a mixture of cultural differences and translation hiccups, Japanese stories like Final Fantasy XV tend to wear their heart more prominently on their sleeve than their Western counterparts, and I think that this, informed by the eccentricities of its open world and Prompto's photography, only works in Final Fantasy XV's favour. As it's written, Nox's story is twee and maudlin, it's incoherent and awkward, but these broad strokes contrast well with the subtler tales told by the game's emergent systems. If you think about it too hard, the wider story, the lore, is a shambles. But it's a suitably dramatic shambles, one that provides enough off-the-wall moments to put the foursome through their emotional paces. The game's main narrative does well to monopolise on the goodwill generated by its world and Prompto's photography, and this is largely because it knows when to step aside. The game's first two-thirds are light on explicit plot direction, instead giving vague, distant goals, and as a result, more focus is placed on the shared experience between the player and the game's characters. It's here, while looking for vague MacGuffins and running errands for increasingly wealthy cardboard cutouts, that the game's systems are given free reign to do their thing. That is, endear the player to the four friends. Perhaps these are the bean bandits. Time to save the legumes, boys! The game's final third, however, places more of an emphasis on the specifics of individual plot details, and takes an unexpectedly dark and tragic turn. In practice, by the time that a cavalcade of anime nonsense really kicks in, the player is already invested, hook, line and sinker in the characters, and is thus more likely to respond to their overt melodrama. The game's unique open world design and Prompto's photography will have done their work by this point, and the emotional broad strokes of the plot, ridiculous though they may be, play along nicely with the game's mechanical subtleties and staunch idealism. I wouldn't want to spoil anything, but once the game enters its final third, it cleverly refers back to its photographs at numerous points. A particular sequence at the tail end of the game encourages the player to go back through their photo album and reflect on their journey, and personally, I think that this is where the greatness of Final Fantasy XV's emotional design really hits home. While caught up in a ridiculous narrative about the end of the world, the player is asked to look back at the Halcyon days before everything went tits up and reflect on their journey and the three collections of pixels that they'd shared it with, in a surprisingly meaningful way. The path up that mountain 20 hours ago may have been prescribed, sure, but the photos taken along the way are unique from game to game, all thanks to those digital bodies that by that point you might even dare call friends. While scrolling through these pictures you can see the development of these characters play out, you might stumble across snaps of old outfits or old locations and draw a thread between them, straight through to those last dimly lit snaps of the character's older, more grizzled selves. A narrative plays out that is fundamentally informed by the nuances of the player's interactions with all four friends. Thanks to the open world's design working in tandem with Prompto's photography, emotional links are everywhere, 
and it's here, in this last melodramatic moment, where those links are exploited to their fullest. In other games, the focus is frequently on you, the player, and what you did. By focusing in on the shared experience of its characters, Final Fantasy XV shifts that focus around to what we did. You may not realise it at the time, but every hour spent in this game's world, every hour spent adding photographs to the album or following conversations into the mouth of hell, is an hour spent developing an organic relationship with the characters within. Individually, Final Fantasy XV's open world photographs and melodrama aren't anything to write home about, but combined, they manage to create something decidedly different. It all pays off in the end, when all of those hours add up into a meaningful release in which the on-screen friendships and the player's journey collide and become one. Ultimately, every aspect of Final Fantasy XV's design refers back to its core relationship, and as such has the potential to create emotional ties. Over time, this wacky story about a group of preen guys on a bachelor party gone horribly wrong becomes imbued with a genuine emotional weight and meaning, and if Final Fantasy XV deserves to be lauded for any one thing, that's it. Stay alive.